Today's sermon is entitled, Your Body. And you might be like, my body? And I'm like, your body. We're gonna talk about the fact that every one of us has a physical body and how God created, crafted, made your body. We're gonna talk about how we use it for God's glory, how we will always have a body. You won't be in heaven floating around as like a spirit or a little cloud, just like, ah, that's not gonna happen. Okay, we're gonna talk about your body. And at times you might be like, this is awkward. And I'll be like, yeah, okay, it's gonna be awkward. That's fine. Let's embrace though that God made us in human form and let's talk about God's purpose and plan for our bodies. We're gonna read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's actually writing to them talking about sexual sin. And he's saying, listen, you need to uh, stay away from sexual sin you need to pursue God's plan for sex, God's plan for your body. And then he writes here in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Actually, let's start in verse 18. He says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? and has, was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. So we see here, just in these few verses, the word body used a lot here. We're seeing a couple, a couple phrases here jump out. It says that God gave you your body. God bought your body with a price. I'm like, he bought my body? What are we reading here? What's going on? And then we also see that our body is a temple that God lives in. So God created my body. He gave it to me. And yet it also belongs to him and is a temple in which he lives in. What does all this mean? Let's break it down. Let's back up a little bit, okay? First, we see in the book of Psalms, David is writing, and he says, you, God, made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You, ladies and gentlemen, are made with a body, and it is fantastic, complex, beautiful, and it is a biological wonder. Let me read to you a couple nerdy statistics because I actually find biology fascinating, though I'm not very good at it in class. I think it's just so interesting how it all works together. Your body every single day has a heart that beats 100,000 times per day. And throughout that day, it circulates through your body 2,000 gallons of blood. So it doesn't mean you have 2,000 gallons, but it means that it is pumping the equivalent of 2,000 milk jugs. All right, I'm at, I, I don't know about you, but I always just really enjoy being able to carry in milk from the car. And when I can like carry four cartons of milk, I'm like, this is like leveling up. This is like as much as I can do. And I'm so proud of that. Or carry as many bags of groceries in as possible. That's a dream of mine to carry it all in one, one trip. But you see here, 2,000 gallons of blood is pu pumped through your body in a day. The human brain can store 2.5 million gigabytes of memory. Let me say that again. 2.5 million gigabytes. All right, that's, that's a little bit more than your iPhone, okay? Your human brain is currently at a higher scale. You might be like, I don't know, chat GPT is pretty impressive. Okay, well, it's pulling from the entire human uh, knowledge base. Chat GPT doesn't sit there thinking up uh, how to think, we have to program ChatGPT even to work and it is used in the cumulative knowledge of humanity. So the human brain is fascinating. Your DNA in your body, if it were uncoiled, would stretch from the earth to the sun over 100 times. The, the DNA in your body is so small and wound so tightly into your cells that if all the DNA from your body was stretched out end to end, it would go to the sun and back. That is absolutely incredible. And so God created our bodies to be so wonderfully complex, to be resilient, to fight, to be able to survive, to be able to function and do amazing things. When you watch the Olympics, 
I don't know about you, but I watched that and I'm like, how are human beings able to do this? Okay, how can human beings run that fast, swim that fast, bend backwards that way, or like do a pole vaulting thing? Where the, that's the crazy one to me is when they're pole vaulting. And it's like, I'm just gonna hurl my human body over a pole that is suspended in the air using another pole like thrust into the ground and sling. It's like a cartoon when they do it. It's just crazy to me. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. But the human body is amazing. And listen, there's, there's a lot of emphasis in our culture on this idea of like, hey, it doesn't matter about your body, how it looks, what you do with it, it matters who you are. Yes, who you are matters, absolutely. But, but you are not a soul, you are a human being with a soul. You are both. You are what I would call an embodied soul. Let me explain. When God made Adam and Eve, it says first that he made Adam's body out of the dust of the earth. Now, he was not Adam yet. He was a body. But then he breathed his soul, his life spirit, into Adam and gave him a soul. Suddenly, his body had animation. Now, the combination of having this body and soul as one then made him a human. And in the same way, when we die, our soul leaves our body, but the Bible tells us that we will again get a new body in heaven. And this body will be perfect. And there is a balance that I want us to talk about today. We don't want to overvalue our bodies, but we also don't want to undervalue them. Our bodies are both wonderful and amazing in what they can do, and yet current in their current state, they are broken and decaying and not in their fullness as they will be. And so I want us to have a proper, godly, biblical perspective on your body because it does not matter what TikTok says about your body, what, what your friend group says about it, what your girlfriend or boyfriend says about it. It matters, more importantly, what God says about it for he is the one that gave you the one that you live in right now. So let's talk about having a healthy perspective on the bodies that God has given us and I want us first to talk about uh, this current uh, statement here. Our bodies are not wicked, but to idolize them, to misuse them, or to abuse them is wicked. And we're gonna go through each of these three things and then talk about their reverse positive uh, way of looking at these things. So first, let's talk about this. Do not misuse your body. God gave you a body so that you could glorify him. And I want you to think that the same body that can be used for good can be used for evil. Sometimes we, we classify items or objects as good or evil. For example, we look at a knife and we go, well, that's evil, it's a knife. It's like, dude, I'm, I'm performing a scalpel surgery on someone and I need a scalpel and knife to cut into this person to carve out the cancer that is in them. Is the knife evil? Well, the knife is just the knife. It is how you use it, right? Or you might say, oh, well, you know, um, uh, a Fig Newton can't be evil. It's a Fig Newton, okay? Fig Newtons are good and wholesome and lovely. Well, what if you're like, I'm going to cram all of these in your face until you choke to death? Whoa, okay, you can use a Fig Newton for evil. Okay, you didn't think about Fig Newtons that way, did you? Okay, yeah, you can use a Fig Newton for evil. And so... We also need to recognize that God, yes, gave us our bodies, but how are we going to use them? Think about this. The hands that you have can be closed into a fist. They can hurt or abuse someone, or they can help up someone who's fallen. The same hands that you might use to, to heal someone, you can use to injure them. The same lips that you can use to gossip, you can use to speak encouragement in life. The same feet that you have can run to evil or run from temptation. You need to recognize that it is the way in which we use our bodies on this physical plane that, that is important. You see, our soul needs a way to interact with the physical world. You might be like, Barrett, this sounds like a philosophy statement. It is. God has given you a physical body. Why? So the things that your mind conceives of and that your spirit desires, you are able to bring into existence. If I desire to pick up my car keys and hurl them at valor in the front row, okay? I have a desire in my heart. It is to 
chuck this at this human child, okay? Sorry, not child, that was harsh. Young man, okay? It's my desire to hurl them, okay? Now, <laughs> Judah's like, hit me, I'm over here. No, no, I know, no, no. I, I feel like it's gonna be hard to catch because it's got all these like little things that are just gonna cut you. I mean, it's not a football, but I, I feel like my phone would be a better example. Just to, I feel like I could frisbee it. Sorry, I'm getting distracted, Carson. Anyway, the idea being, I have this thought in my head, my body is able to bring it into reality. God made us so that we can bring his kingdom onto this earth in the way in which we live. And so we are to use our bodies to glorify him. If you were singing worship a couple minutes ago, you were doing just that. You were using your body for good. Now, what we see here in the context of 1 Corinthians is this. The Corinthian church was struggling with sexual immorality. So you have Christians that have been given a body by God, and Paul's like, what are you doing? You're sinning against God using the body that he gave you. God gave you this weapon for the kingdom of God, this gift, and you are using it to hurt God and hurt other people. And the reason that sexual immorality is so wrong to have sex outside of God's design plan, which is marriage, the reason that that is wrong is because God is the one who gave us the gift of sex, but it is also God who gave us the gift of our body, and we are to use both gifts in a way that is honoring and obedient to him. We should not simply live in a way where it, we say, well, whatever feels good to my body, I can do. Whatever currently feels good. So let's, let's talk about other ways in which we can misuse our bodies, or we could even say we can abuse our bodies. God gave us these gifts of these bodies, and there are many ways in which we can abuse them. First, I could abuse my body in not taking care of it. If someone gives you a beautiful car, let's come back to my analogy. Actually, it's not a good analogy. My car isn't beautiful. Uh, I mean, I love my car. Uh, I think Honda Civic is like peak uh, 2005. That's the car. That's the dream right there, okay? Anyway, some of you are like, yep, that's the dream. Some of you are like, wow, that's sad. Uh, anyway, let's say you have a brand new, beautiful car, Ferrari, and you just give the keys to a friend and like, awesome, I am gonna go off-roading. And you say, excuse me, <laughs> what did you say? I want you to keep it in the garage. I don't even want you to take it out of the garage. Like, that'd be horrible. You wanna take care of that car that someone lent to you. And when God gives you a human body, take care of it because on this earth, you get one. You get one body. Care for it. Exercise, be healthy, eat decently and well. Make sure that you are active. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of our bodies, but, but there's also ways that we can abuse our bodies. You can abuse your bodies with various substances like drugs or alcohol. You can abuse your body from excess, like smoking too much or even eating too much junk. Listen, let's, let's break these topics down because some of those words are like, ooh, he said diet or he said alcohol or some of those words kind of trigger us a little bit. Let's break it down one by one. First, let's talk about drugs. Um, you're gonna misquote me on this and that's okay. Um, it is okay at times for some humans to do drugs. You're like, oh, bear, my, I'm gonna get in the car today. I'm, I'm nervous to ask, sweetie, but what'd you learn in church today? My pastor said it's okay for people to do drugs. That's what he said. I don't know, so I guess I can do drugs. No, okay, well, keep listening. Your doctor might deem that you have an infection and you need an antibiotic and drugs can be beneficial to help your body, heal your body, improve your body. Now, what we're talking about when we usually talk about drugs is recreational drugs. Are recreational drugs acceptable? I think it's a wrong question to ask, is it acceptable? Ask, is it glorifying to God? For example, people will get addicted to a drug called heroin. The people that are on heroin will say, this feels very good, so I will do it. Then they get addicted to doing it and they are unable to stop. It brings them to a high where they forget about their problems, and they are mentally enjoying the substance, but they're doing it at the expense of their health, 
And also they are not able to control themselves. The addiction begins to control them. And when they are on the substance, they can't control themselves. There are many different drugs that I could break down. But when it comes to taking drugs, we need to ask this question. Is it glorifying to God? The Bible says that we are to be led by the Holy Spirit. And if you are taking a drug to get a high, you are essentially saying, I am seeking to be led by this substance to get this high so that sometimes people are like, well, I just want this drug so I don't have to think about my problems. The Bible says we should take our problems to Jesus in prayer. The Bible says that I should focus on the Lord and then my problems alleviate because when you take drugs to avoid your problems, you eventually come off of that high and your problems are still there waiting for you. You see the, the difference there? When, when we take a drug to escape our problems, eventually the high goes away and you're right back to your problems, if not lower, because now you've wasted time and also all you desire to do is get back to the drug that makes you forget about your problems. But they're still there. Listen, you're going to hear from a lot of adults over your life probably, hey, don't do drugs, kids. Don't do drugs, kids. They have all kinds of really weird things in public schools to encourage you, like dogs that are like, don't do drugs, kids. I'm like, I see a talking dog. That's what I would see if I was on drugs, okay? Like that, that's really confusing to me, all right? I don't, I don't know why I would listen to this talking dog, okay? But there's this idea of you need to take ownership of your own body and the substances that you're going to put into it. Are you going to take illegal drugs that can affect your health negatively? Let's talk about alcohol. Alcohol is not inherently sinful, just like fire is not inherently sinful. Now, if you are under the age of 21 in America, it is illegal to drink alcohol, so it is wrong or sinful for you to do until you turn 21 and it becomes legal. But then when you turn 21, you individually, personally, will have a decision to make about alcohol. And it is a sin in the Bible to get drunk. The Bible clearly states that it is a sin to drink to the point of excess. And the reason is because Christians, you are to be led by the Holy Spirit, not by alcohol. And when you get drunk, you are not yourself. You ever heard the phrase, oh, they're in good spirits. What's that essentially saying? It's essentially as almost a joke saying, yeah, some other spirit is basically in possession of them and they're not themselves. If you've ever seen someone that you love drunk, some people think, oh, it's funny. Oh, that's hysterical. I just think it's sad. Because the person you know isn't there and something else is there. And they are being led by this substance. And then the next day they're vomiting and throwing up and miserable and they have a hangover and a headache and they hardly remember what happened the night before. And what will happen is the culture will say, ha-ha, that's normal and that's funny. You're drinking to the point where you're poisoning your body to where your body is regurgitating and vomiting it up. And then you're doing things that you regret or are life-altering. That is not funny or glorifying to God. And it isn't even fun. And so again, I'm not up here saying that drinking alcohol is wrong. It is not. However, however, please be careful with it. Just like fire is not inherently evil, but you must be careful with it or it will burn you. And alcohol can burn you. I'll give just these three statistics and then I'll move on because I don't want to appear that I'm lecturing you, but I'm warning you. If no one drove drunk, 10,000 human beings just in the state of America or just in the, the state of our country, would be alive next year. Because every year, 10,000 people die from drunk drivers. People that get drunk, get in a car, and make a mistake. 50%, 50%, half of all domestic violence where somebody within the home attacks someone else that they love, and 50% of sexual assaults take place with alcohol involved, where someone has drunk too much alcohol. So if everyone obeyed the Bible and didn't get drunk, you would immediately save 10,000 lives, if not more, 
and you would immediately get rid of half of the physical abuse that takes place and the sexual abuse that takes place. I want you to think about that and consider strongly when you get to the age where you can drink, is this something for me? Please be warned in this way. Again, your body is to be used to God's glory and it's not to be abused with drugs or with alcohol. And the same goes for smoking, recognizing, hey, it's not inherently a sin, but we need to ask the question, how is this furthering or helping my body? Same with diet. It is not wrong to eat an ice cream cone, all right? You are not in sin to be like, I'm eating this ice cream cone, or someone comes up to you and be like, how dare you, how dare you eat McDonald's? Do you hate your body? It's like, whoa, chill, okay? I can eat McDonald's, okay? I, I can occasionally enjoy something that is good, right? But if I get to the position where I am being extreme in my diet, it can be wrong. Now, this goes both directions. Listen, you can abuse the way in which you eat by overeating horrible foods and not eating vegetables and fruit and healthy foods, or you can also be unhealthy in your diet and being so extreme, so legalistic about it, or even to the degree where you are under eating or overeating. There's, there's this tension, this healthy tension that we need to have in our view of our bodies where we are taking care of our bodies and not abusing them. All right, let's keep going. We also do not wish to idolize our bodies. I think that our culture will either tell you two things. One, hey, it doesn't matter the way that you look, your body doesn't matter, disassociate with it, that's not important. Or they'll tell you, maybe not even directly, but they'll tell you through the Instagram algorithms or the YouTube tutorials, hey, you're ugly and you need to become more beautiful for people to love you. There's two extremes. Either, hey, looks don't matter, just be affirming of how everyone looks, or you are not beautiful and you need to become more like this person. You need to look more like this standard that has been set. And people begin to idolize their bodies. You know what's ironic? Some of the most insecure people about their looks are actually some of the most beautiful people. Some of the people that are obsessed with, man, I really want to look good. I really want to uh, take care of my body. And I want to, let's say like a guy's like, I want to grow big muscles and I want to like look ripped. And then they are actually super insecure every time they go to the beach because they're wondering, am I good enough? Is this enough? Or the girl that's beautiful and naturally that way might, might look in the mirror and think of all the ways in which she would change her body. Literally, it happened to my daughter the other day. She was looking at one of her, her Barbie dolls or one of her dolls. I can't even keep up with them all. And she was, she was looking at it and she was like, why does Anna have red hair? And I'm like, well, that's the way God made her. And my daughter has this like beautiful blonde hair and she's just like, oh man, kind of wish my hair was her hair color. And it made me so sad. I'm like, but you're my girl and you have this beautiful blonde hair, okay? And then Judah's over here with red hair and Judah's like, I have honest hair. And like, you know, he's got red hair. He's like, I have honest hair, like whatever. Like, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, and like God made you with that hair and Tali made you with this hair. And my daughter Eden literally have all three, has brunette hair, she's got brown hair. And honestly, it might change colors. As kids get older, their hair hair changes colors. But how often Satan drops this little lie in your heart that you're ugly? Like if you actually traced back the belief that you might have that you were ugly, I'd almost ask the question, who, who told you that? And why did you believe it? I have students come up to me and ask me about heaven a lot. And recently a student came up and asked me, hey, when we get to heaven and we get our glorified bodies, will we all like look like supermodels? You know, like, will all of our problems and mistakes go away? And I'm like, well, who told you that those were like the standard of beauty? God made us with the body that you have and he loves you. He loves your soul, but he also loves your body. He loves both of them. He thinks you're beautiful. Now, I'm not saying you can't, you know, if, if you're a person, dress up and try and look nice, or you want to put on makeup, put on makeup, or dye your hair, dye your hair, do that, that's fine. But, but do not do it because you hate your body, because you think you're not beautiful, or don't do it because you are so self-absorbed with the way that you look that you think it makes you more important than other people. 
This is an uncomfortable topic because we are self-conscious. And even as I talk on topics like this, it's interesting to look around the room because people with their bodies show what's going on in their minds and their hearts and they begin to fidget and move and feel uncomfortable in their seat. And then when I say something like that, they suddenly all stop because they're all self-conscious about fidgeting and moving. And now all of you are like, well, what do I do now? Do I stop fidgeting or moving? But you're thinking about it. Listen, listen. This is uncomfortable because of the culture and because of our sin nature. We are looking at our bodies in a lens of Instagram or in a lens of Photoshopped, airbrushed, just this, this, this frame, what I'm looking for, this filter that is not healthy because God looks to us and says, I see you as you are and you're beautiful. Look, I, I look at my, my daughters and my son and they are mine and I cherish them because they're mine. And they are so beautiful to me. And we need to recognize that we have a father in heaven that looks at you as his sons and daughters and says, I made you not just the way that you are, but even the way that you look and I look at you fully. And so when you get to heaven, there's, there's kids asking that question, will I be beautiful in heaven? My answer is this, no, no, no. Yes, your body will not have any defects. Like for example, if you couldn't see on earth, yes, your body will be able to see in heaven. Or if you had an illness on earth, the illness will be gone. But, but please don't mistake that you will be in heaven and you will finally recognize how beautiful you actually are. You will finally be at peace when you look in the mirror and not immediately look in the mirror and gravitate to things that you would change or things that you hate. You will be at rest with the way that you look. You see, in heaven, you will finally find comfort and wholeness and completeness. And so often, guys need a girl to tell them that they're beautiful or at least attractive. Usually, guys don't like to hear that they're beautiful or pretty. Guys like to hear they're handsome or they're hot. Like, that's usually what guys want to hear, right? Or girls, to feel beautiful or pretty, need to hear it from a guy. But I truly think that people are blessed when they actually just simply believe it because God has made them the way that they are and they have this confidence in that. So let's look at it this way, all right? Your body is a temple to God and we need to operate and live and think accordingly. Let me land the plane here a little bit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives in you if you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit dwells in your heart and in your body. Your body is worthy of housing God Almighty. He did not build a temple that he is not proud to live in. He is thankful. Thankful is the wrong word. He is willing to enter into your body and to live in you and with you. So in the same light, when you think of this temple, this church that you're in, there's a certain level of respect that should be given and hopefully is given. I see students walking around picking up trash and it makes me happy. Like, hey, this is God's house. We should take care of it. I see students being mindful to straighten the chairs or put away the Bibles afterwards. I see people being like, whoa, whoa, whoa chill, chill, chill. Like when you guys go into main sanctuary, I see you guys in a good way on your good behavior, making sure that, all right, we're in church on an Easter or Christmas, or as we try to strive for during worship or teaching, hey, we want to be respectful of God, and that is the reason why we tell you guys not to talk during teaching or be a distraction during worship. It's not because I personally am like, man, I just really, really, really need you to respect me or respect the people on stage. I, I frankly don't need that, but God does. So we need to respect his house and church, the reverence that is here. In the same way, if God lives in your body, take care of it, clean it up, treat it as sacred. And even when Paul talks about this, and we'll talk at another later sermon about sexual immorality more, 
But even when Paul says that, he's basically saying, listen, the way in which you use your body in sex should be something that glorifies and honors God because when you operate in the way in which God wants you to with sex, you are using your body as a form of worship. And yet when you don't, you are doing a horrible thing with your body. You are doing something that is wicked. Now certainly God can forgive you and will. Please remember that. But also we need to recognize that God gives us our bodies that we might use them for his glory. So, Find this tension. Don't hate your body. Don't look in the mirror and despise the way that you look and wish to change it all the time, but also don't look in the body or look at your body and overglorify it. Think that your value and worth in its entirety is held in the way that you look. Don't idolize it to the degree that you treat certain people better than others based upon their looks. That is not how we're called to operate. But we need to operate in this sense where I don't abuse my body, but I don't overvalue it. So care for it, use it well for God's glory, and make sure that we are continuing to further God's kingdom in the way in which we use our lives. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness, and for these students. And Lord, I pray pray against the lies that Satan will whisper into their ears about the way that they look. Lies about the way in which people perceive them. Lies about the way that you've made them. Sometimes Satan will whisper lies into our minds or into our hearts that God made a mistake when he made us. Or he doesn't care about us. Or that, that we need to alter what God has done in order for it to be right. Might we find peace in the way that you've made us, Lord? Might we be led by your spirit, not by any substance or even pursuit of simply what feels good in our flesh? And might we honor you with the way in which we raise hands in worship, sing loud with our voices, but also that we care for others and love them. And we love you, God. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen.